Where's the, uh, you know, the volume yet? to our contemplative Eucharist here in the barn at Bon Beau with our Bon Beau community. We welcome all of you from whatever time zone you may be in or whatever part of the world you may be in, early morning or late at night, we welcome you all into this time of worship. I got a bit of a shock this morning when I got a, a call from someone at nine o'clock, who started talking about something that was going to happen tomorrow, Monday. 
and they were totally convinced it was Monday. And I said, no, it's Sunday. And they said, no, 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 Lawrence, it's Monday. And this exchange went on for a while until I began to doubt my own sanity. And uh, I thought, well, did I miss mass yesterday or did I, did I forget it? And uh, eventually uh, I looked up my calendar and it told me it was indeed Sunday. It's easy to doubt something that you are sure of when someone else is totally convinced about it. And you begin to question your own beliefs. And this conviction that we will be exploring and, and approaching in this Eucharist, this conviction about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, that is why we are here. And it is Sunday, but it's also the same conviction or the same truth, the same perception of reality that brings us here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and all the other days. It becomes a way of life, but of course it is good to have our convictions challenged and as well as enriched and deepened. And this conviction about the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is a unique and extraordinary conviction. And for some people it's an insane one, it's a fantasy. It's taking something literally that can only be believed in metaphorically. But we can't settle this question of the conviction about the resurrection as easily as we can about whether it's Sunday or Monday. This conviction, is it a belief? Is it a hope? Is it an experience? What's the best word to describe it? Whatever it is has changed the world and is changing the world and is changing lives, even as we sit here. It's stronger than the people who believe in it, stronger than the church which carries this message. It has a life of its own. And that perhaps is where we can experience the truth, the fact that it has a life of its own, better and stronger than the people who communicate it. And it's not just an objective matter of fact, although it has an objectivity as well, but it's a truth that intimately touches every person. If you even begin to believe even if you begin to open yourself to this conviction about the resurrection, then you are already living in a new way. You've taken something new into your life. You found a spiritual path even that reveals your life as a spiritual journey. And in this time of of the global health crisis, but it's also, I think, a crisis of meaning for us, a spiritual crisis. These are important questions to ask about how we live and what are the convictions, what are the values, what are the deep feelings that we are living by. And these are important questions because in a time like this, we so easily feel hopeless, or powerless, or frightened, or panicky. Sarah Bachelard began her series of talks on, on hope last Tuesday, and uh, it's a series of six that will begin, uh, the second one will be uh, this coming Tuesday, which is the day after Monday, just in case you didn't know. And in the first talk on hope, uh, she quoted the early scriptures of, of the Christian tradition, first letter of Peter, where he speaks about our being 
able to live through a new birth into a living hope. That's something very valuable and clear as we feel our way uncertainly through this crisis and what will inevitably be a long and painful aftermath. She reminded us that hope is not just will-based, forcing yourself to believe something like a fanatic. It's not just something uh, we believe in because the alternative is too terrible to imagine, despair, panic, that's too frightening, so I'll believe in this. I'll believe in anything. But it's not just a matter of the will, but a matter, as she pointed out, of deep listening, of deep attention at the deepest level that we can exercise it. And therefore, hope ultimately is a contemplative thing, a fruit of deep attention, deep listening. And for this, we need a practice, a path, that's the gift of meditation, to help us to listen to the truth of things, not just think about them, have our opinions, argue about them, get angry, get on your high horse. But it means to become what St. Benedict calls obedient. And obedient doesn't mean just doing what you're told, staying indoors, observing social distancing, it's more than just doing what you're told. Obedience is about this deep and wholehearted listening and other-centeredness. So that's why we come on a Sunday to this Eucharist, to deepen that listening and find that spring of hope within us. So let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. What can destroy hope is guilt, or shame, or fear. So let's open our hearts the greatest power available to us, the power of love in the form of forgiveness, to set us free to hope from the depth of our being. Let's ask forgiveness, let's ask for mercy, and let us give forgiveness and show mercy wherever we can. Gracious and loving God, teach us to look forward with hope so that the power of the resurrection may transform our lives and our world. Because you have made us to be your daughters and your sons, 
to see each other as brothers and sisters. And you have restored the joy of our youth. We make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Acts. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stood up with the eleven and addressed the crowd in a loud voice. Men of Israel, listen to what I am going to say. Jesus the Nazarene was a man commanded to you by God, by the miracles and portents and signs that God worked through him when he was among you, as you all know. This man who was put into your power by the deliberate intention and foreknowledge of God, you took and had him crucified by men outside, outside the law. You killed him, but God raised him to life, freeing him from the pangs of Hades, for it was impossible for him to be held in its power since, as David said of him, I saw the Lord before me always, for with him at my right hand nothing can shake me. So my heart was glad, and my tongue cried out with joy. My body too will rest in the hope that you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor allow your Holy One to experience corruption. You have made known the way of life to me. You will fill me with gladness through your presence. Brothers, no one can deny that the patriarch David himself is dead and buried. His tomb is still with us. But since he was a prophet and knew that God has sworn him an oath to make one of his descendants succeed him on the throne, what foresaw and spoke about was the resurrection of Christ. He is the one who was not abandoned to Hades and whose body did not experience corruption. God raised this man, Jesus, to life. And all of us are witnesses to that. Now, raised to the heights by God's right hand, he has received from the Father the Holy Spirit, who was promised. And what you see and hear is the outpouring of that Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christian faith is 
communicated through stories, not just through ideas. And stories have characters, people that we recognize. And the characters of the story, like Peter in, in this passage from the Acts of the Apostles, we don't know much about him or the other disciples. We don't know that much about Jesus from a biographical point of view. But we feel we know them. Why do we feel we know them? I think it's because they, we see them change. We know people through change. You think you know someone. We think we know them. And then they surprise you, maybe totally, by acting out of character. Did I really know them? We only really know others and also ourselves when we change. Peter here is a changed man. He, before the resurrection, he was often a bit silly and frightened or impetuous. But here, he's very different. He's confident, he's clear, he's brave. And he's expressing this conviction of the resurrection. God raised him from the throes of death because it was impossible for him to be held by it. Strange saying, God raised him from death because it was impossible for Christ to be held by death. So there's a strong conviction, but he's also searching for ways to express it. You have shown me the path of life, he quotes. You will fill me with the joy of your presence. He goes back to the scriptures to try to describe this experience that he can't really describe. And joy is the proof of the resurrection. It's a joy that has no right to be there, yet has shown itself and been felt and cannot be denied. It's the joy that you may have felt during this time of confinement or loss or anxiety at what's happening financially and to your career or to your family or to you psychologically. It's a joy that can break through when everything else says, give up. Give up hope, give up a belief in anything. It's a joy that you don't even want, perhaps, because it's easier to give up and die to despair. Despair is the death or the dying of the soul. And it's a temptation. Many people, perhaps, in the difficult circumstances of life today are feeling. It's a temptation like an addiction or a fanaticism or a fantasy to escape. But joy can appear even in the dark night of despair and begin to revive the dying, even the dead soul. This is what we might sense that Peter experienced. Peter describes the resurrection. What is that? The experience of Jesus's real presence, not a fantasy presence, not a memory, but the real presence. Just as we may be present to one another, or more or less real to one another. 
So Peter describes the resurrection in the best language he could find, which was the language of his own religious tradition, which he was soaked in. So was Jesus. And so Jesus is described here as a fulfillment of the prophecy of that tradition, the Jewish tradition. Tradition that shaped the individuals and the whole culture of the Jews. And that's how it had to start. That's how this transmission of the experience of the resurrection had to start there because that's where it started. But what about the non-Jews? What about the Cockneys of London or the people from Brooklyn or the people from Nigeria or the people from the Pacific islands, totally different cultures. Is the resurrection only a reality to Jews? Can it only be described in terms of the Jewish story? Do you have to become a Jew to get it? Very early on, Pentecost, first Christians said no. It's not just for the Jews and it can't only be described in the language of the Jews. The first Christians knew that the resurrection meant a new universal global community. And you had to form that community with people you didn't like. People from very different languages and different traditions. It's what we would call today an international body like the WHO or the IMF. But it wasn't an international body like the Roman Empire, enforced by brute force and colonialism. But it was an international body, the body of Christ, that communicated itself by love. The weakest and the strongest force. And that work still continues painfully to build a world with that experience of unity and care, compassion, concern for each other. And I think many of us are hoping that that vision of a world unified, caring, just, will be advanced by the crisis that we're passing through now. And the resurrection, whether you see it or you don't see it is in the Christian experience part of that work maybe the driving force of that work of building a better humanity Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Preserve me, God. I take refuge in you. I say to the Lord, you are my God. O oh Lord, it is you who are my portion and my cup. It is you yourself who are my prize. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel, who even at night directs my heart. I keep the Lord ever, ever in my sight. Since he is at my right hand, I shall stand firm. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. I'm 
so my heart rejoices, my soul is glad, even my body shall rest in safety. For you will not leave my soul among the dead, nor let your beloved know decay. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. You will show me the path of life, the fullness of joy in your presence. At your right hand, happiness forever. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. La deuxième lecture, la première lettre de Saint-Pierre. Bien-aimés, si vous invoquez comme Père celui qui juge impartialement chacun selon son œuvre, vivez donc dans la crainte de Dieu. Pendant le temps où vous résidez ici-bas, en étranger. Vous le savez, ce n'est pas par des biens corruptibles, l'argent ou l'or, que vous avez été racheté de la conduite superficielle héritée de vos pères. Mais c'est par un sang précieux, celui d'un agneau sans défaut et sans tâche le Christ. Dès avant la fondation du monde, Dieu l'avait désigné d'avance et il l'a manifesté à la fin des temps à cause de vous. C'est bien par lui que vous croyez en Dieu qu'il a ressuscité d'entre les morts et qui lui a donné la gloire. Ainsi vous mettez votre foi et votre espérance en Dieu. So this is St. Peter again, speaking out of this transformative experience of the resurrection. And you just heard it in French. I read it this morning in one English translation and the, my missile here gives it another English translation, which reminds us that it's all in the translation. We don't know the exact words that Jesus spoke, they, we know them through translation. That means we have to interpret them. We have to make them our own. But the translation that I read this morning has this phrase that caught my attention. This is Peter talking to these early communities about the new kind of lifestyle that they had begun to live and to let go of the old life that they'd been living. Because if you're living an old life and it's got a few addictions and a few hang-ups in it, then you get attached to that, it's difficult to change. But, and I think many people today, are, we're going through such a radical change of lifestyle we're wondering whether we will be able to change for the better 
live a better lifestyle after this. And what Peter says is, yeah, you can do that, but you have to conduct yourselves with reverence. That was the phrase that caught my attention. Conduct yourselves with reverence. Reverence. Living with a spirit of reverence not of just profit or exploitation or success or fame or entertainment or distraction, but with reverence. And I looked up the word reverence, the etymology of it, because it has, the roots of a word tell you a lot about its meaning. And it's linked to the idea of respect, respect with deep, or being touched by awe or wonder. It's not very evident in ordinary life that we live with that spirit of reverence, but life is to be revered. At critical moments, such as we're passing through now, we sense that there's something sacred about life. You can't just put a price tag on it can't put a price tag on the most important things, your family, your friends, your health. You can't value that commercially. Shouldn't that mean that we live with a different kind of economy, different kind of financial mindset? Does that mean perhaps that we should give more economic value to caring to how we care for the vulnerable, the poor, the disadvantaged, the losers in society, that we actually recognize that that caring, which is always underfunded and in the new kind of neoliberal economics, uh, you kind of, there's a sort of distaste for spending money on caring for people, but isn't that perhaps the most valuable thing? Isn't that really at the heart of any just economics? That we care, we revere, we give, we have reverence for those who are in the greatest need. It's not all about how much you make or how productive you are. And Peter here, I think, is saying that this reverence this respect and wonder has now become unavoidable because of the universal presence of the resurrection. That's his take on it. And history has perhaps proved him right. It's not complete, it's not finished, but it has changed the world. And we're going through a, a time of such profound change we need to understand the values, the forces of change that we are experiencing. And he ends this passage by saying, I think it's the same translation, you would have faith and hope in God. So what is God? This catch-all phrase doesn't have much currency in uh, the boardrooms of the banks and the uh, parliaments of the world don't speak about God, they speak about God privately or at weekends. But isn't this the most important word? However we define it. God, to have faith and hope in God, not as a distant idea or a mythical or a psychological projection or something we've just invented, but God as this living presence that has soaked into everything, including our very own consciousness and all our ways of perception. You can't get away from God. On the other hand, this God waits, works without force, without 
manipulation. This is the source, this is the energy of that reverence, that care and attention that any human family, organization, community, nation should needs to show to each other. According to Luke. This is the gospel of the uh, story of the two disciples in the road to Emmaus. And as I feel I've been doing most of the talking so far, I'm going to ask Catherine to read it for us. Uh, okay, I think in English. Otherwise. Uh, no, it doesn't. Yeah, read it from there. Two of the disciples of Jesus were on their way to a village called Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking together about all that had happened. Now, as they walked, now as they talked this over, Jesus himself came up and walked by their side. But something prevented them from recognizing him. He said to them, what matters are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped short, their faces downcast. Then one of them, called Cleopas, answered him, you must be the only person staying in Jerusalem who does not know these things that have been happening there these last few days. What things, he asked. All about Jesus of Nazareth, they answered, who proved he was a great prophet by the things he said and did in the sight of God and of the whole of the whole people and how our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and had him crucified our own hope had been that he would be the one to set Israel free and this is not all. Two whole days have gone by since it happened, and some women from our group have astounded us. They went to the tomb in the early morning, and when they did not find the body, they came back to us and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who declared he was alive. Some of our friends went to the tomb 
and found everything exactly as the woman had reported, but of him they saw nothing. Then he said to them, you foolish men, so slow to believe the full message of the prophets. Was it not ordained that the Christ should suffer and so enter into this glory? Then, starting with Moses and going through all the prophets, he explained to them the passages throughout the scriptures that were about himself. When they drew near to the village to which they were going, he made as if to go on, but they pressed him to stay with them. It is nearly evening, they said, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Now, while he was with them at the table, he took the bread and said the blessing. Then he broke it and handed it to them. And their eyes were open and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and explained the scriptures to us. They set out that instant to return to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 assembled together with their companions who, who said to them, yes, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then they told their story of what had happened on the road and how they had recognized him at the breaking of the bread. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. I was in Emmaus a few months ago during the uh, pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And my fellow Olivetan monks, Benedictine monks, uh, run a, have a monastery and run the, uh, the, the, the site, supposedly, of this, uh, of this story. And it's a small monastic community a French community, and uh, I joined them for lunch. And we um, had the midday prayer, and then we, we moved in in a casual, informal way into the into the dining room. And I noticed there was a dog that was following us, and the dog was nobody else was looking at it, so I assumed the dog was part of the community, and. Nobody gave it any special attention, but it had its own routine. It, it had a little basket where it sat during the meal, looked at what was happening. And then after the end of the meal, after grace, the dog get up, got up and went around licking up any crumbs that had fallen from the table. And I don't know why, but I thought of this appearance of Jesus to the two disciples, almost that you don't notice it at first, but it's there. And the two disciples are anxious, talking, exchanging opinions, just as people do today about the, the virus and did you read this? Did you see that? Did you see that article? And uh, you know what's going to happen? And, you know, we're full of, full of bits of news that we picked up here and there. But not really 
saying very much, just expressing their anxiety. And then Jesus, it says, it, it, I think in this translation, uh, drew near, where he says here, came up and walked by their side, which is a good translation, but you could also say, drew near to them and walked with them. So he wasn't beamed down in a great flash of light, you know, from Star Trek. Uh, but he was just there. He stood in the midst of them, is another way it's described, or he showed himself, or he went and traveled with them. This is the, the way it's described. It's, it's about recognizing him as a companion. And the gospel is about companionship, how our relationships with each other matter. We need to share, to talk, to walk together. And during this time of the pandemic, we feel that very strongly. People, even if you're living in a small group, a family group, or often feel isolated. So we need to have that feeling of companionship. Zoom has helped us ama amazingly. Family gatherings have happened. Uh, I mean, everyone I know is, has a family gathering every week. They meet with the, grand with the grandchildren, separated lovers meet across oceans. So the need for companionship is intense and natural. And we accompany each other however we can. If we don't, we suffer the loneliness of the human condition too extremely. And that is part of the human condition to be alone. But companionship, community, allows us to deal with that and to turn that loneliness into solitude. This is the other virus of our modern culture is loneliness. The numbers of people living alone in rich countries has accelerated enormously since, since the middle of the last century. Norway and Sweden, I think, have nearly half of all their households are composed of people living alone. Some cities, it's the majority. It's most likely to happen in rich countries. Stockholm, I think, has 60% of its households are single, what do you call it, single dwellings. In, uh, by the next decade, in the UK, they're predicting that one in seven households will be single dwellings. 14% in France. 28% in the US, 13% uh, I read somewhere in New Zealand. Now that doesn't mean that everyone who lives alone is feeling lonely and isolated, but many do. And many feel that for one reason or another, it may be a breakup of a marriage or the death of a partner that um, this is the best way they can, they can live and deal with the loneliness of the human condition. Many people face this in this crisis. Dying alone is what most people fear most. And yet many people are just dying alone today. Living in such a society with smaller families, much more mobility, living alone, all of this calls for new and deeper levels of companionship. We need to go deeper in human relationship to be able to deal with this. And that's therefore the search for community 
which is so strong among those who are living alone, as well as others. And spiritual community and companionship on a spiritual journey, having a connection by whatever means, by Zoom, by whatever means, at this deeper level of our human spirit. Every kind of relationship brings us a step closer to transcendence because it is about taking the attention off ourselves. This is what we see in the story of Emmaus, I think. The two companions were joined by a third and the third is always transcendent. Sometimes we, the third is a stranger. But God often comes to us in many mythologies as a stranger. In many of our rich countries today, we fear strangers and we want to keep them out. We want to keep them at a distance. But the disciples didn't recognize him at first, although later they realized that they had felt it. They felt his presence, not as a stranger, but as someone who knew them and who they would recognize. This was a feeling. But spiritual feeling isn't just an emotion. It's a perception. It's a knowledge. You can't label this kind of knowledge or rationalize it, but you to feel it is to know it. And that's the knowledge that our society with all its cleverness and all its technology has often forgotten. Spiritual knowledge. The meaning of recognition is that we know again. For Plato, uh, all learning is about developing a knowledge that's buried deep in the soul and it needs to be born. And so the teacher is someone who brings that out like a midwife, educare, to lead out. And Jesus is acting like a midwife here to the two disciples. He's not just giving them the answer, prepackaged. That would just be ideology, but he's helping them at every level to see and discover the truth for themselves. Truth, the Greek word for truth, aletheia, is, is an, means an opening or a disclosing or an uncovering. When this begins, when we begin to see the truth, we often resist it or deny it, or get scared of it. And we run away back to the familiar. Maybe we'll do that after this crisis. We'll want to go back to way things were. Or maybe there will be enough people who have seen the truth to be able to make a change. So Jesus can be seen here as a teacher, as a friend, as a companion, and as a teacher, he doesn't deliver answers, but he gives, he gives hints and he nudges us and he's pushing us a little bit to come out of our comfort zone. And the pains and joys of life teach us as well. And then when they recognized him, what happened? He disappeared from their sight. What did they feel? Sad? Depressed? No, they clearly didn't, as they felt energized, empowered, and they turned around and they went back to Jerusalem that they were running away from because they were frightened of what would happen to them there. So they, their fear was dispelled. So where was Jesus then? Well, that's our question too. Where is Jesus? Was he no longer accompanying them? 
later, before the ascension, he says, I am with you always until the end of time. But he disappeared from their sight. Didn't disappear, he disappeared from their sight. That form was no longer necessary in the dualistic world because now they had seen him with the eye of the heart. When you see with the eye of the heart, that is a deeper, more complete knowledge and vision than just seeing something out there. So this strange and beautiful story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus tells us a lot about our own journey and about the companionship with each other on the journey of life and the journey through this crisis. But it also opens us up to this transcendent dimension in which we can also experience the companionship of the risen Jesus. So as we prepare to offer the gifts of the altar, let's take a moment to offer our prayers to call to mind those we would like to pray for, to feel connected with, who we would like them to feel they are connected with us. You see in front of the altar here, we have our book of prayer and there are people who would like to have their name in the book of prayer just as a sign of, of, our, of their connection with us here in Bombo, you, you can do that. But let's take a moment to offer any prayers that we would like to share for ourselves, for others, for our world. Les communautés qui entourent euh, la communauté suisse avec le langage de la communauté allemande, la communauté française et la communauté italienne, euh, qui sont chères, tous chers à mon cœur, euh, qui euh, aident la communauté suisse, la communauté suisse à, à poursuivre son travail de, de méditation et de création de nouveaux groupes. I'd like to pray for all the trade men and trade women who are the ones whose businesses may not be open after this crisis. I'd like to pray for Bertrand Bobou and his family and um, all of the people working for him in his business as they had a, a fire last week. Pray that things settle down and also in thanksgiving to his neighbors who have aided the business and the working teams. I would like to pray for young men who um, when I worked in a care home he was he was there and he took his life this week. I'm praying also for the other children who are, of course, now being grown up and but are still in touch with him, his family, and for all people near us or further away who struggle with addiction. told each other in our prayer in the community that we share during this mass around the world and in that community let us hold those who have 
no companions or no companionship to strengthen them during this time. We make our prayer through our companion, Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God, our Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice of the Lord May the praise and glory of His name, for our glory and for all His holy churches. Lord, receive these gifts and the gift of ourselves. May the great joy that you give us be shared with all of humanity and come to its fulfillment. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with and your spirit. spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is right and just that we should always and everywhere give you thanks through Jesus Christ our Lord. We praise you with greater joy than ever in this Easter season when Christ became our Paschal sacrifice. He is still our priest, our advocate, who always pleads our cause. Christ is the victim who dies no more, the lamb once slain who lives forever. And so the joy of the resurrection renews the whole world while the choirs of heaven sing forever to your glory. fountain of all holiness, let your spirit come upon these gifts to make them holy, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Before he was given up to death, the death he freely accepted, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take this, all of you, and eat it. 
for this is my body, which will be given up for you. When supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks and praise. He gave the cup to his disciples and said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sin may be forgiven. Do this in memory of me. Let us proclaim this mystery of faith. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. In memory of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Father, this life-giving bread, this saving cup. We thank you for counting us worthy to be in your presence and serve you. And may all of us who share in the body and blood of Christ be brought together in unity and friendship by the Holy Spirit. Lord, remember your church throughout the world. Make us grow in love together with Francis, our Pope, Pascal, our Bishop, and all your ministers. We pray for unity and the healing of all divisions between Christians. And we pray for new friendship and collaboration between the sincere followers of all traditions. We pray for those who have died this week around the world through this virus or for whatever reasons. You've called them from this life. They have died into Christ. May they also share his resurrection. Remember all our brothers and sisters who have ever gone to their rest in the hope of rising again. Bring them and all the departed into the light of your presence. Have mercy on us all. Make us worthy to share eternal life with Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, St. Joseph, her spouse, with the Apostles, St. Benedict, and with all the saints who have done your will throughout the ages. May we praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honour is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray for the coming of the reign of God in our, in our lives and in our world, in our own mother tongue. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil and grant us peace in our day. In your mercy, keep us free from sin and protect us from all anxiety as we wait in joyful hope for the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sin, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and the unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the risen Lord be with you all. And with your spirit. Peace be with you. As we pass communion around the uh, community here, we'll sing the Holiness Day in French and invite all of you at home in some way to have some little sign, whatever might seem appropriate to you, to share in our communion.
This is the body of Christ, the Lamb of God, our companion on our journey. Happy are we who recognize him in the breaking of the bread and in each other. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. May the body and blood of Christ bring us to everlasting life. Amen. We'll meditate now for about uh, 15 minutes.
Disciples recognized the Lord Jesus <clears throat> in the breaking of bread. Alleluia. And now let's bring our prayer here to a Conclusion, as we thank God for the grace that we have shared, grace of companionship with each other and with the Lord, and pray that this grace will strengthen us for the week ahead and strengthen us also to share it, to be of service to be companions to others. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Just before we end with the, the blessing, to um, ask Giovanni to say a word about, um, we're going to be starting the yoga next week and maybe the uh, online meditation. So um, we're hoping to start with uh, uh, one time a week or a daily online meditation uh, starting next week. We think we'll begin on Thursday at midday with the online meditation, but we will let you know um, over the weekend, today or on Monday. And also, we're beginning um, a weekly Tuesday afternoon class. Yoga class. Yoga class. And now I'm just trying to remember the time because it's a slightly complicated time. But it's at 4.45. 4.45 for an hour on Tuesdays. And um, we'll let you have uh, my email address so that you can also comment um, about the, the way we're doing the class, if it's helpful, and also about the time, um, because there are other options um, where we might do this class. We're also, as, as here at Bon Bo, as we advance in our yoga practice, we're also, we've been filming um, some of the sessions, and I hope to be able to put those up online. They won't be live but they will be oriented towards the beginner or the intermediate and so on, and covering different themes. And these will be shorter sections. So you will be able to, if all goes well, you'll be able to go and make a class for yourself based on these. That's a separate project from the online Tuesday yoga class. Thank you. Okay. Um, good, thank you. Also, just so that you know, we're, we're conscious of the limitations of language here, and English is the, is the universal language, but we'd like to be able to do it uh, more in French and also, of course, other languages. So we're exploring uh, online simultaneous translated subtitles. And I was looking into that yesterday, actually, and even experimenting a bit, but uh, pretty amateurish at the moment. So if any of you out there in the world know, uh, have any uh, advice or expertise you'd, you'd like to share on that question, the technology is there, it's just what is the best way of doing it. Um, let, please let, let us know. And uh, we're, shortly going to begin a big spring cleaning project here at Bombo, which will make, keep us busy and uh, keep, make the place even more beautiful. So we'll be sending you some photos of, of our progress on that. 
but um, and the uh, spiritual path website continues to to grow and be very enriching I think for people so thank you for your comments uh, as I mentioned Sarah Bachelard will be giving the second of her series of talks on Tuesday at one o'clock French time <clears throat> and uh, Stefan Reynolds has um, begun a, a series on uh, mystics uh, from the mystical tradition, uh, beginning with Julian of Norwich and then moving to the cloud of unknowing. And uh, very wisely and interestingly connecting their teaching to uh, the, the contemporary uh, challenges that we are facing. Julian of Norwich, for example, was a 14th century mystic who was self-isolated for spiritual reasons. Uh, locked herself up, had a bit of contact with the outside world, not with Zoom, but uh, through opening her window. Um, but uh, some very useful wisdom, I think, coming from that mystical tradition. So, um, and there are some short video lexios, th three or four minute pieces, uh, which we've started to put up as well. So, you may not be interested in all of it, but I think uh, there'll be enough there to, to, to find something that would be a companion for you and uh, share that companionship of the journey of meditation. So let's ask God's blessing on each one of us and upon the whole human family that has gathered together in this Eucharist and pray that what we have shared here today may bring grace and joy and peace to many others. May the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit come upon us and remain with us now and always. Amen. Amen. Let us go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.